I became a film critic because I studied it in college. Um, I studied film studies. Um, I'll start again because it's study, study. Okay. Uh, I, be I became a film critic because I studied it in college. Um, I never imagined that studying film uh, appreciation and film on an academic level would lead to being a film critic. Um, I, in fact, had no plan to become a critic at all. I probably had a prejudice against critics. I thought they did, you know, uh, a kind of parasitical job. So uh, when you're in college, you think, you know, you're going to be a filmmaker, or you think you're going to be an artist. So I would say, honestly, I became a film critic by default because the study I did prepared me to be a critic, you know, analysing films, watching films, taking them apart. And um, you say that... Um that possibly the, the natural career trajectory that you imagined you might have had at the time was to become a filmmaker yeah. rather than a critic. Um, it's, often, it's often said by the public that, um, that all film critics are kind of filmmakers, monte, or you know, that, that we've yeah. missed our real profession and we're yeah. bitter about it or whatever. Do you, do you feel that that now holds for you? I don't feel I'm a closet filmmaker. Um, I have... I've definitely tried to write screenplays uh, and they were awful. I'm terrible at dialogue. Um, I've become a novelist in my spare time because I think I'm kind of good at writing prose and maybe being a film critic has made me a better novelist. Um, that's by way of a sort of ego massage of whatever you know doubts I might have, I might have had about uh, my abilities and, and, and my wishes. But, uh, but you know... Um, not to really remember, but I, I'll say it again. Um, uh, okay. What's the honest answer? Um, <laughs> yeah. Do I, no, no, it's a, it's a good question because I really I want to be you know, truthful about it. Did I? Because I was in college, all we did was just watch films and, and criticize them like film critics. So. Um, okay. Um, but you don't still harbor ambitions. Oh, God. To be a no. Um, no, uh, I do not harbour any ambitions to be a filmmaker. I have been, in the course of 20 years, on enough film sets to know how uh, it's such hard work. It's harder than most jobs you can do. Uh, and I've been a builder and I've been a waiter. Uh, but working on a film set, being a film director, you need to be a specific type of person. Um, and I, and I, I, I think it suits me better just uh, to write. Um. And do you make a living from film writing or do you have a day job? Uh, my day job is film writing. So um, my film writing pays my mortgage. Um, so that's interesting in itself in terms of, you know, um, how you approach films. Because uh, you are inserted in some sort of economic production process from, you know, Spielberg who gets the 20 million to make a film to me paying my mortgage. We're all in this great big sort of soup. So it's... Uh, I'd love to know what how I'd be as a critic if I wasn't paying my mortgage. Um, well, you'd probably write in the same yeah. way, but you, but, yeah. but um, but you are one of the lucky few. It's yeah. very, it's, uh, uh, yeah. um, it's a great position to be in. Okay. Like, yeah. Um, um, all right. Um, before I kind of ask you sort of abstract questions about what film criticism is, yeah. um, maybe we could uh, address some misconceptions that the public has about film criticism. Sure. Is there anything that people in general often say about film critics that you think needs to be challenged? Well, that they're old white men, which they are. No, <laughs> no. Um, they're a bunch. Film people say film critics are a bunch of old white whingy men, and I've seen a couple of women, uh, so it's not true. Uh, the biggest misconception about film criticism is that it's a consumer guide to films, and that our sole function is to tell uh, a member of the public how to spend the cash at the weekend. That drives me insane. There's a certain amount of film criticism out there that is that, but it just seems so far removed from what I think, anyway, the job should be. Well, certainly a very large, not, not all, but a large proportion of the people that we've interviewed for this film, for this, for this documentary, think just that. They, they okay. don't think that's the only thing they do, but they yeah. certainly think that that's a key part of what they do. Uh, I mean, consumer advice. Yeah. Um, um, so given that that isn't what film yeah. critics do, what do they do? Okay, so what film critics do is that within the um, okay, I don't know, um, 
what film criticism I think should be is there always is this the sine qua non of any film review should always be a bit of consumer advice that's the sort of shell it's wrapped up in which is are you going to see this movie why should I pay my 10 pounds within that there's a million other possibilities I can tell you what it shouldn't be first it shouldn't be um, I enjoyed this film I didn't like this film this film was in the middle that shouldn't, it shouldn't be that. It shouldn't be, it was directed well, it was acted well, it was written well, it was nice production design, and it was edited well. These are, I think these are minor concerns, and they're often the crutches upon which uh, a lot of film criticism leans. That being said, what it should be, what it should be, how long have you got? What it should be is, um, within the shell of being a consumer advice product or consumer advice text, I feel that film criticism should be engaging with what the movies are doing, what the movies are doing in society, what the movies are doing in relation to ideology, what ideas the movies are perpetuating. Um, it seems blatantly obvious to me that movies are incredibly relevant to how we live our life. They're, you know, they're how we talk to each other, how we talk to ourselves, how the culture talks to itself. Um, you know, uh, there's explicit examples all, you know, for the past, you know, for, since, since movies began. There's that thing, you know, the Columbine Killers, The Matrix, Old Boy, Virginia Tech. You know, there's these terrible examples. Um, you know, uh, Richard Nixon well, watched the Green Berets before launching an offensive against the North Vietnamese in Cambodia in 1969. You know, George W. Bush uh, was screened at the Pentagon and the Battle of Algiers before invading, you know, the 2003 in Iraq. So... There's these amazingly explicit, hit you over the head examples of how important film is and how it interacts with the life we live, but also on a sort of um, on a, on a less tangible, on a more sort of ethereal way. You know, it's I totally believe in um, you know Jacques Lacan and the mirror phase and how you're constituted as a subject watching a film. You know, it's it's the most amazing, it's the most sinister thing to do to watch a movie. You're elbow to elbow with with strangers in the dark. And you kind of lose yourself, you know, it's hallucinogenic, you know, um, I take notes the whole time when I'm watching a film, and I know it's a good film when I've stopped taking notes, and I'm just kind of in the sort of, in the Oz dream world. Um, and no one's ever questions, you know, that process is very bizarre and very dark, that we, we do this thing weekly where we give our consciousness to somebody else. Um, this, is, this, is, this is like a fucking huge idea. And to, to take that idea and say... It was directed well, it was acted well, it was written well, is, is the most insane type of bullshit you could imagine. Thank you very much. By the way, that is the best answer to this okay. question that we've had right. since we started. I think, would you agree with that? <laughs> it's, um, I don't know, maybe you wouldn't, but... Yeah. Uh, no comments. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> um, I don't always ask this question, but uh, I'm, I'm, there's sometimes a distinction is drawn uh, between film reviewing and film criticism, like the film critic and the film reviewer. Okay. Do you think that that's, um, that that's um, something that makes sense in the real world? But what is that distinction? How would you, where would you draw the, the line between um, those two categories? I see no distinction whatsoever between a film critic, a film reviewer, and even a film feature writer. You know, the person who interviews Michael Fassbender in a hotel and writes a peach. Uh, fuck. The person who... Yeah. The person who meets Michael Fassbender in a hotel room on a junket and writes a piece about them, about him, that's... I'll do it again. <laughs> there we go. The person who meets Michael Fassbender in a hotel room on a junket and writes a piece about him, uh, that's still a piece of film writing, and that's still really important. That's still part of the conversation. So um, the minute you sit down and start writing words that will be printed and uh, read and consumed about, about film, you're entering the debate, you're entering the conversation. So um, there, for me, there is no distinction. A, a film reviewer and a film critic, they're doing the exact same thing. Perhaps one's a slight bit more pretentious, but the other, you know, the other is they're, they're still doing, they're still writing about film. Um, and uh, you said uh, earlier that you think the, the thing that film criticism shouldn't do or certainly shouldn't prioritise is the declaration of whether a film is good or bad or right. you like it or you don't like it. That, that yeah. kind of evaluative response yeah. to a film. Um, at the same time, um, we all know that yeah. um, it's become part of the kind of conventional demands of publication um, that we're often required to provide something even more reductive than evaluation, which is the star rating, this kind yeah. of summary of um, of of an evaluative yeah. response. And um, do you do you, uh, you do you are you required to provide? Yeah. Um, what's your take on star okay. ratings? Okay. 
Um, my take on star ratings is also my take on uh, the structural shell of the review, which is whether it's good, bad or indifferent. I believe that needs to be there. I believe we live in a, we live in a, a time scarce world and I want to open a page and I want to see three stars, four stars. I want to see five stars, I'll read it. I want to see one star, I'll read it to see how bad it is. Probably won't read anything in between. You know, I, I, want, I want a hit of information quickly and then I want to get into the meat and the potatoes of the review. So I believe in the star rating and I believe in the body of a review saying whether it's good or bad. You know, I know myself, I get frustrated sometimes with the New Yorker because there's no star rating and I have to plow through the review to know what they think. But, you know, because it's the New Yorker, of course, I'll do it. So um, I would love if the New Yorker had a star rating. You know, it would make my day easier. So I totally, in this, you know, info overload world we live in, I, I think the star rating is, is useful. At the same time, you said that, um, and I mean, I think what you said reflects what a lot of readers think, um, yeah. that you would be more inclined to read something with one star or five stars yep. than anything else. Um, as a writer of yeah. a film, um, I don't want to put words in your yeah. mouth, but, but there must be times when you actually think that all the interesting stuff is happening somewhere in between there. Um, or that yeah. some of the interesting stuff is happening somewhere yeah. in between there. Um, and um, does it not bother you as a writer? Yeah your considered appraisal of a film that isn't straightforwardly yeah. fantastic or terrible yeah. Yeah. Um, is going to be overlooked because of the star rating yeah. that you're portioned to it. The honest star rating that you're portioned to it. Um, you know what? Um, I'll be slightly controversial here and say that um, I think in some sort of meta level, 90% of films that are released are all three star films. Um, if you were to give every film three stars, it would be uh, pointless and confusing. Within that three star meta umbrella, I think you find the five stars and the one star. And maybe your job as a writer is to make that argument, to provoke the conversation. Um, if I was, yeah, yeah. Uh, if I was to give every film three stars, I think that would probably be honest. You know, that some of the best films of the year I've seen are kind of three star films, you know. Um, but. It's, it's very much a sort of, um, it's an argument about, uh, you know, again, it, it's that point where the, the structural shell of the consumer review meets um, the serious job of what you're trying to do in articulating the ideas in the films. Um, and, you know, I think in, in, in that meeting point, it's up to you to push it up to a five star or down to a one star. And not, not literally a five star, but like four star or two star, but... Um, a film can't just exist in, in perfect mediocrity. Do you, um, when, you're, when you're ascribing star ratings, do you kind of uh, torment yourself over it or is it just, you just put it down on the page and it's very simple and straightforward? Um, it's, I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, you're, you're really screwed if a film is three stars or if, if a film is telling you it's three stars and it's kind of your job maybe to dig around in it and find out whether it's four stars or two. Have you um, had the experience ever of um, having one of your star ratings editorially altered? Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, no, I have been aware that uh, my star ratings are not editorially op altered, uh, but I, you can feel the pressure often, and you often have to fight your corner as to why something should be lower or higher. Um, Spectre, the latest James Bond film, I just loathed um, for so many reasons I won't go into now, but it was within this sort of um, tsunami of just gushing praise towards the film and uh, it would have had to be a you know, serious editorial conversation about why I would only give it two stars at, mo at most. So um, you don't, yeah, you don't read the paper and go, oh my God, they've taken away a star, but you definitely have to fight your corner if you're, if you're going against the, the tide. History is going to vindicate you, yeah. I'm telling you. But, um, yeah. um, anyway, yeah. um, so um, ch changing the subject somewhat. Um, <coughs> um, since you, by the way, what, what, what year did you begin? Uh, writing a uh, film. Yeah. Um, in, I began writing film criticism in 1990. Five, I wrote a 50 word review of oh god hang on Alzheimer's it was uh, god it was for MTV magazine called blah 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 and it was a 50 word thing they ran on the side of the page and what was it for okay 
I wrote my first film review in 1995 for an MTV magazine called Blah Blah Blah, and it was a film with Eric Cantona called Happiness is in the Field. Okay. I think it's probably five stars. Okay, well, since yeah. 1995, yeah. Um, I would, um, could you tell us what kind of changes that you've seen in the, in the business of film writing? Like? Um, Okay, the two changes, uh, the two the two biggest changes I've seen in the business of film writing uh, in the past is that twenty years, yeah, um, have been uh, a parallel uh, shrinking of space uh, for for word length, with uh, a greater and this is such an obvious point a greater obsession with celebrity. So all over and and I don't just write for the Times, I write for other publications all over the print all over printed journalism. Maybe 10, 15 years ago, there was this sudden, you know, uh, reality TV celebrity obsession and big names, big stars started to feature everywhere. You wouldn't buy a magazine, you wouldn't buy a newspaper in the art section unless there was a sort of glamour, glamorous figure on the front. This, uh, the effect of this was that you'd interview only A-list, never really B-list directors, rarely got a shout, definitely not writers or, or sort of, art, you know, art directors. Whereas maybe before that, you do a funky piece in special effects, you don't do that now. So um, that bleeds into the reviewing as well. There's the, you know, not quite the celebrity obsession, but a magazine, a newspaper, um, a, a, you know, a cultural product would like to have a picture of Brad Pitt, uh, you know, on their reviews page saying Pitt's movie, Pitt is shit or Pitt is great. You know, and that's, that's kind of everywhere. So I didn't, you know, yeah, 1995, people weren't really that celeb obsessed. They just wanted maybe funky ideas or um, an interesting argument. So that's definitely that's, that's yeah that's the biggest and it's really obvious you know celebrity culture blah 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 but it's it's the biggest change. And I, I get the impression, perhaps wrongly, that you you see this definitely as a as a regression. This is a this is this is a decline rather than progress. Of... Um. Yes. Uh, okay. Celebrity obs celebrity obsession um, is not good for any type of you know uh, rigorous cultural thought at the same time um often the most uh, urgent important arguments about culture are happening in the mainstream you know uh, i am fascinated by you know these comic book movies and their sort of you know, tacit assumption that violence is cool and the fact that they're all over the globe and that the, you know, the, the the tentacular reach of mainstream hollywood is kind of terrifying and so I don't really, you know, I don't have a problem every every week reviewing, you know, a big blockbuster because often, you know, you're doing you're fighting the good fight when you're talking about a blockbuster because it's it's such a, you know, it, it's the apple of of movies and it's it's everywhere and it's in third world countries. It's in, you know, there's, there's just this sense that, you know, the reach is so huge and the ideas they're perpetuating are sometimes so strange that um, you need to be on the front line, you know. Uh, Scarlett Johansson, Lucy, this whole, I'm fascinated by this whole thing of, of strong women who, uh, strong women in, in spandex who we look at and sort of, you know, visually wank off to for 90 minutes and they're feminist role models. All that stuff is happening in the mainstream. It's not happening in the interesting, you know, Gaspar Noé movies, you know. Well, he's, he's doing his own thing in this bunking off department. Um, so it's, you know, um, I also thought, you know, this is uh, apropos of nothing, but I find this fascinating. The Jihadi John videos borrowed explicitly from the finale of David Fincher's Seven. Um, they're almost, you know, eerily identical. You know, the, the orange jumpsuits, the beheading, the desert landscape. I'm not saying it was a deliberate homage. I'm not saying the guy who shot them ever saw Seven. But that conversation is happening and you can't stop it. You know, that's why film criticism is really fucking important. You know, it's it's in the ether. Again, going back, you can't just say it's a good film, it's a bad film. These things are, are you know, are pulsing around us. So um, that was a point. Okay. Above, yeah. Now, you said that that was one of two major changes that there had been. Yeah. What was the second? Uh, word space. Shrink, shrinking word oh, right. space. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. And um, you don't regard the rise of the internet and of digital journalism as being a profound uh, change from your perspective? Um, the rise of digital journalism was a profound change about a decade ago. Um, everybody kind of lost their heads for a bit. Uh, magazines and newspapers just started letting staff go and hiring sort of social media tweets with massive followings because they just were desperate. Uh, there was a one-way one thought process, which was we need to get people who have followings to read our, our product. 
that's kind of uh, petered out a bit, you know. Uh, certainly, you know, plenty of uh, broadsheet publications are, are making nice coin from subscription services. Um, I, I'm a novelist in my spare time. Books, the book market has seemed to levelled out as well. People aren't worried about Kindles anymore. Um, that sense of panic was definitely, it started a decade ago, and it's only in the past three or four years it started to peter out. Um, online film critics are amazing. Some of them, the stuff I read is just mind-blowing. It's so much better than anything I could write. But it also emulates the modus operandi of the internet, which is it often seems to be quite niche and quite subjective. So you'll get the most amazing horror movie experts, the most amazing sort of uh, academics, but they seem to be writing about one thing in particular. So... I don't know if that's a threat to the so-called mainstream critics, um, but you know the aggregate websites like Rotten Tomatoes have a thing called top critics, and it's not because they're the best critics. I think it's because they've got the broadest remit. So um, yeah, I, I don't know if the internet is, is 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 a threat anyway. The internet is being used by the you know top critics um, as much as it is by anyone else. Um. How, how have social media like uh, Twitter and Facebook um, changed the actual culture of film criticism itself, or have they changed it? Oh. Uh, I, don't I don't know. Have they? Um, okay. Uh, well, yeah. I wouldn't know. But I, I've left Facebook, but yes, Twitter. Um, yeah, I think social media has had an impact in the sense that I know studios are very nervous about the Twitter sphere and the social media sphere. You know, this is rattling a lot. I don't know if you're going to pick it up, but I can hear every time I move my hand. I can hear it's, it's cold. Yeah, is it okay? Yeah, it's fine. I'll leave it off. Um, so, uh, social media, yeah, social media has, has it. Uh, oh, fucking hell. Okay, start again. That's all right. Um, okay. Yeah, so social media does play a part in, uh, you know, sort of new appreciation of films in the way that I know that studios are very worried about the sort of, uh, you know, avalanche of opening weekend Twitter comments, you know, and that how a film can be killed in the water by, by word of mouth. But uh, I don't know if the numbers bear that out. And if, you know, if, if a studio markets a movie, you know, as, as, as you know, oh, I'm not really not making any sense with that. Um, I'll try it again because I, I kind of I have an argument, but it's, it's OK, here we go. Get ready for the magic. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I, I think the so social media has had uh, an influence um, on film criticism to some ex to some extent, or to the culture of film reviewing, in that there is this fear around the opening weekend of a movie about what will be tweeted and how fast it'll pass around the world that the movie either sails or stinks. Oh, I can't say stinks. That's a, a mixed metaphor. Sails or stinks. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Um, one more time. You know, sometimes you're just not really enjoying a question, but I'll do it. Okay, so, um, okay. Uh, I think social media has had an impact uh, to a certain degree on the world of film reviewing. It's, there is, there's a lot of fear around the opening weekend and what will happen on the Twitter sphere and will the word, will there be bad buzz around a movie? Um, I'm not sure if it's if it's more important than word of mouth among friends or or just you know uh, box office receipts, but it's certainly uh, it's relevant. Um, is it? Um, but has it had an impact specifically in the way that it's used by film critics themselves or by publications right. themselves? Um, um, I know, yeah. Uh, so there is an element to social media. Okay, there is an element to uh, contemporary film criticism where you're encouraged to tweet either your review, your whole review, or your praise of, of the film, what you thought of the film. So, um, again, I'm not sure if 140 characters are going to do anyone any favours in terms of a, a film review. All it can do is create a word of mouth around a film. And I'm not totally interested in that as a sort of, uh, you know, as a platform for any sort of discussion. Um, the the kind of flip side of social uh, uh, sorry the rise of digital writing is um, that you know some some would say that um, the print is in trouble um, right. is it do you think from from your perspective as someone who's worked in print for a yeah. long time um, is print in its death throes and if it is does does it even matter I don't think print is in its death throes uh, certainly um, books are doing well I wouldn't say doing fine but books uh, in the past quarter have had a resurgence I believe uh, from reading my FT and that Kindle isn't seen as a threat anymore. Print is in broadsheets and magazines. Um, 
Well, the, you know, the broadsheets have found a way around you know, the print decline by just becoming subscription services. So the brands that they represent are as strong as ever, I, I believe. Same with, with magazines. Uh, I think there's a lot of sort of wily smart people involved in print in all forms who are daily uh, being put to task with the job of making sure it doesn't decline any further. So I, um, I guess I, I, I can kind of anticipate what your answer yeah. to this question is going to be, but um, uh, what future do you see for, for film criticism, and more specifically for professional uh, okay. campaign film criticism? All right, okay. Um, yeah. Um, the future of film criticism. Uh, you know, I don't know. It's, yeah. uh, I don't know if it's... Um, Okay, hang on, because it's so hard, you know, uh, when I'm doing my job uh, and I, I get paid for it, I pay for mortgage, so, so I'm trying to imagine, you know, the, the freelance situation. Um, I think, yeah, um, I'm, I, I, it's hard I, for me to speak about, you know, other other people's jobs and how... Do, because, you, do you worry about your job? May, may, oh, may, okay. may I personalise this? Yeah. Oh, is that okay? Oh. Yeah, do I worry about my job? Um, I mean, has your job in the last 10 years, has there, has there been a time in the last 10 years okay. where you've actually thought, oh boy, I'm going to need to do something else, or I'm going to need to find another yeah. occupation? Because um, well, that's why I became a novelist. Uh, but yeah. I, d yeah, I don't know if I became a novelist, because, um, you know, uh, well, you know, my very personal relationship with film criticism goes through waves and cycles, and sometimes I hit a point... I had a point in 2001 where I'd seen about 3,000 movies and I just, I was a film editor for a magazine and I just quit and went to live in a fishing village in the north of Scotland. And then, obviously, about a year later, I ran out of money. So I had to come back and start again. So uh, I don't see it totally on an economic basis. I believe life is too short. And if you see everything on an economic basis, you're kind of screwed. So um, I believe it should be a lot about the passion, about uh, the idea of, you know, engaging with the ideas you, you're, you're presented with. So... Um, do I, it's also, um, it's quite a privilege to be a film critic. It's, quite, it's an amazing privilege to get paid to write anything, you know. Um, if, you've, if you've been in the workforce in any other capacity than a writer and you suddenly pay to write, it's incredible. So um, I also believe on the flip side of that, that there will always be a need for film critics um, and not just this whole crusader thing and exposing ideology, but... Um, there still isn't a way uh, to get a, a better bead on what is happening in a film, what is going to happen that weekend, to do the sort of consumer guide thing than a, a film critic. Uh, and it, it's, it's the same with um, the digital world. You know, um, you go to trusted brands. So that's probably why the broadsheets and that's why, you know, the men's magazines and, uh, you know, the, the, the heavily branded publications are doing okay because... There's a proliferation of voices out there, and it's really noisy, and it's a mess. And I don't know how many people go to a film every every weekend without either reading the review or without straight after seeing it coming back in, and reading a review. So I think that there's always a place for it. For you personally, when you've when you've written a full review of a mm -hmm. film, yeah, would your sure. ideal reader read it yeah. before seeing the film or after? Um, I think. <laughs> it's you know it's it's a complete paradox because possibly the conversation my review is having is with somebody who's seen it and can I, I'm trying to uh, very gently chivvy them towards a certain idea about how I feel about the film, um, but the paradox is it's there to kind of uh, chivvy them towards going to the film or not going to the film. So it's doing two things at the same time. Hopefully, professional critic should be valued higher than an amateur critic if the professional critic knows what they're talking about. Um, there are plenty who don't. Um, yes, so I would say, uh, you know, with my humble hat on as well, I don't think I'm that great. You know, uh, the only thing I have going for me is I've probably seen more movies than Joe or Joanna Bloggs. Uh, I, I've got a master's in film consumption. I've maybe been I've been nudged by you know by tutors and professors towards little areas in a film that maybe you mightn't be nudged in. So I kind of feel that my job is like a sort of um, 
avuncular relative who's kind of taking someone on their lap in a non-pervy way and just telling them, hey, you know that, you know, um, the Avengers you're about to see? Well, you should really look out for this, that and that. Um, but uh, it's still me being subjective. Um, so it's still just me. And there's, you know, there's an incredible amount of um, arrogance in the whole act of being a critic. You know, and it's sort of, it's, it's humiliating that I do it because it's my job. And I, yeah, I, I'm completely conflicted by the idea that um, at the end of the review, the, 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 the chromosomal essence of it is me saying, I think it's crap or I think it's great. You know, it's just me. So I think maybe that's why I'm such a stickler for this thing that we need to unearth the arguments uh, root around in the ideology because at least that's not me you know that's not just my fucking opinion going you know and that's what's sort of um, emetic about so many reviews when it just becomes their opinion fuck you I don't want your opinion you know uh, I, I want to know you know what's happening in the film and how it's relating to my life um, it's just not good enough to have a sort of 56 year old man say I didn't like it, so you're not going to like it. You know, there, there must be something more than that. Thank you very much. Can we not stop just yet, but can I just check the door until our sure. next interview? Okay. Is that okay? Not yet, so that's not a problem. Okay. Um, right. Um, sorry about that. Um, right. In fact, I only do have um, yeah. two more questions. Sure. One of them is a, a stupid and wacky question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Go ahead. Wacky's uh, good. Which is that? What is the um? What's the the oddest or the oddest thing that's happened to you in a in a screening room, like in a press at a okay. press screening, or around you, it doesn't have to be to you. Okay, um, plenty of odd things happen in press screenings. Lots of sleeping. Sleeping, that's the big, uh, yeah. The, you wouldn't believe the amount of people who sleep and snore. Sleeping and snoring. I'm amazed uh, at the amount of sleeping and snoring that happens. Um, the few, uh, some masturbation, only a bit. No, no, I'm joking, I'm joking. No, I'll see. <laughs> no, I just uh, sleep. I've only got sleeping. Anything else? Those Bellatar uh, movies. What yeah, exactly. Oh, <laughs> well, it's just like Tarkovsky. <laughs> yeah, okay, so um, there, is, there is sleeping, a lot of sleeping. And um, you know what's the oddest thing? For, for when, you first, uh, when you first enter the higher echelons of film criticism, and you go to you know you know the, the screening rooms. Um, the, the the oddest thing I, I found was this kind of disrespect towards the film, uh, a communal sort of hive-like behaviour, which was uh, a scoff in the within the first five minutes um, of a sort of alpha critic that would be repeated through the, the other critics and the sort of communication that was happening uh, very subconsciously towards the film. Um, and I found that very strange at first that, um, you know, that the, the default setting going into a film was slightly cynical and scoffy, which I think is, is the sort of valid cliche about critics, that they're sort of frustrated and bitter. But um, I don't know if that, if that applies that much now. This, maybe I'm thinking about sort of 10 or 15, when I first started going to these screenings. Um, where there were lots of much older older men, um, which, which now there's, thankfully there's, there's lots of women coming up and um, younger people. So um, people who can't believe they're already yeah, screening. Yeah, yeah, people who, who are yeah. pleased to be there. So um, that was odd. Yeah, yeah. Cyn instinctive cynicism is odd, but um, and then sleeping is odd, and then excuse me, um, the heating is a big issue. Uh, often the heating is is too high or else in certain screening rooms it's too cold, but this makes me sound like it's beyond first world problems, who cares? Get, get over yourself, the heating's bad, but yeah. So. And lastly, although it's quite a big question, yeah. is there anything that you would like to kind of get off your chest that you feel we haven't addressed? Because there's obviously lots yeah. of things about film criticism we haven't yeah. addressed. Well, I haven't got off my chest yet. Um, um, ba -ba 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 -bum. um I would love, you know, I've made myself sound way too academic and sort of, you know, even uh, name bombing Lacan and all that. You know, I would love if there was some sort of exam to be a film critic where you just needed, you know, I feel like I would love to write a little book to give to all critics and just say, just, you know, read this for a bit. And I'm sure, I'm sure there's so many critics who know all this crap and I'm just uh, preaching to the converted, but I don't, I don't feel it in the writing, but I... I would love a more um, academically rigorous approach to film criticism that wasn't boring. 
you know, um, there are certain academic publications that do it really well, but are a tiny bit boring. So I, I wish there was a sort of a happy ground where you could, um, you know, make the sort of shagging jokes in your copy, but also end on Louis Althusser and, you know, uh, Marxist ideology or, I don't know, Brecht and, and distanciation. You know, I wish, I wish there was a way to do it. Not, not that I want everyone's film review to be the same, but um, as you can tell, I get frustrated with the idea that it's just good, bad and different and we just talk about the director and the acting. Um, because that's, that's not film criticism, that's just, you know, watching.